what we're going to look at more closely now is the narrative practice. What I mentioned about how to turn values into the emotional, the, into the resources, the moral resources that we need to confront challenges with hope as opposed to fear, with empathy as opposed to alienation, and with a sense of self-worth as opposed to self-doubt, so as to be able to engage challenges proactively rather than try to distance ourselves as far as we can, as quick as we can from them. These three questions about story of self, story of us, story of now. When I was doing organizing, I was always very interested in strategy, obviously the David and Goliath situation, because we were always David dealing with Goliath. There was another little matter, which was that you could have this wonderful strategy, but if nobody showed up, not such a great strategy, right? If people were scared, if they were divided, if they were cynical, if they weren't present, you didn't have a strategy, you had a theory. The other dimension, motivation, mattered just as much, if not more, than the whole question of strategy. How do they work together? Strategy says how, but motivation's about, well, why? We make sense of the world in different ways. You know, one way we map the world is cognitively. We map where things are in relation to each other in the world, and that's very important, and it helps us find our way from here to there. It helps us answer the question, how do we do it? How, what's an efficient way to do it? Critically important. It doesn't tell us why, why it matters, just tells us how, but not why. So there's a second way in which we map the world, and that's our affective or emotional mapping of the world. What, what we experience as good, as beautiful, as lifts us up, puts us down, disgusts us, frightens us, enhances us. That second mapping, that emotional mapping of the world, is actually how we value the people, objects, and experiences of the world. And so the valuing that we place is through that emotional side of mapping because that's where we go to answer the question, why? So we've got two pieces. Now strategy is the, do is the how domain. Narrative deals with the domain of why and it deals with the domain of the heart. And as the chart suggests, you need both to move the hands because you're not gonna move the hands at all if you don't have the motivation but you're not gonna move them skillfully if you don't have the strategy. And so it takes both dimensions to actually engage. Now, a second key point is to appreciate the fact that if we're going to deal with values, and that's one of those words that's used so many different ways, you know, values, values, values. But if you really think about what values are, values are not intellectual abstractions, they are actually how we feel about things what we actually value. You know, uh, St. Augustine wrote about, it's one thing to know the good, he said, but another to love it, and loving it is what enables action upon it. Emotion, motivation, motor, it's all the same word, that which moves us. And what we value is what moves us, in fact. You know, you get to that choice point, you gotta do this over that, why are you choosing this over that? Well, you may go through a whole logical exercise, but in the end, it comes down to what, what do you value more? So the second point I want to make is that emotional information is critical information about ourselves and about the world and understanding how to operate in it. And this whole idea that we got to, you know, just suppress emotion, just get emotion out of the picture, you forget that because that in itself is the most emotional response possible because it's a fear of emotion. It's about fear of emotion rather than understanding that we are emotional creatures, we are reasoning creatures, and emotion is not without its own reason, its own way of, of teaching and learning and growing. We know that there are certain kinds of emotions that facilitate mindful action, and I'm saying mindful action, and others that inhibit. Most of the time, we're on autopilot, right? Most of the time, we're, we're operating out of habit. We're habitual creatures, and it's very efficient. So our brains have evolved what's called the surveillance system that lets us know when something unexpected is coming is, is happening. Our surveillance system says truck, sees truck, truck. It tells us truck, truck. We experience that as anxiety. The anxiety is very positive because it pulls us out of habit and puts us in a place where we can choose another course of action. This may sound weird to say, but sometimes one of the critical roles of leadership is to create anxiety. In other words, is to create enough challenge to shake people out of their habitual way of screening out everything that disagrees with what they already think, or what we already think, because we're really good at that, you know? You know, we're really good at just putting aside anything that, that differs with what I already, and so to get me open to a fresh thinking, it takes an emotional engagement, not simply, oh, let me tell you the argument another time. Oh, now let me tell you a 43rd time the argument. 
It's not, that's not what's happening. I'm not paying attention. It, it, I, I don't need to. So now, how do you create that kind of constructive anxiety so as to open people up to fresh ways of thinking? Urgency is one. Urgency really helps, right? You know, you know I, I got to decide the rest of my life, but I got an exam tomorrow morning. I'm going to do the exam. You know, this is like, there's two kinds of urgency. There's urgency of need. This can't wait anymore. And then there's urgency of opportunity. There's only two days left, and then, then we'll blow it. Creating urgency is one powerful mechanism for breaking through and making challenge real. Anger. And by anger, I don't mean rage. I mean outrage. A reaction, that reaction of, this isn't right. That's healthy. That's good. We need that. It's the dissonance between the world as it is and the world as we believe it ought to be. And that dissonance is crucial because it creates tension that then can result in action. Now, if it doesn't result in action, it's a problem. And so, but creating the tension is a critical part of moving us to be ready to act. So that's one side of the equation. But so we got everybody anxious and, oh, oh, that's good. That's cool. All right. Now what? What's our default response to threat? What's our default response? Fight, flight, yeah, right, fight, flight, you know, you know it's like, you know, I'm going to strike out it, I'm going to run away from it, or I'm going to freeze and hope it doesn't notice me, you know, like that, right? Fight, flight, freeze. Now, that may have been very, very helpful on the savannas of Africa when our ancient ancestors were wandering around, uh, uh, you know, worried about saber-toothed tigers or whatever. But once we started to live with other people in communities, it became more and more dysfunctional. That every time there's a problem, fight, flight, freeze. Every time there's a challenge, fight, fight, flee. So culturally, we develop tools to be able to manage the fear reaction. We develop emotional tools capable of managing the fear, managing the isolation, managing the self-doubt that we often experience when we confront a threat. And what are those tools? Well, one of them is the capacity for hope. By hope, let me just say, I don't, somebody wrote about something they call hokey hope. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about, hey, everything's gonna be all right tomorrow, you know, flowers in May, no. It's, there's, there's a definition of hope that the 12th century scholar Maimonides gave that I really like. It's a little complicated, but, but bear with me. He says that hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. What he's saying is that to be a realist is to recognize that the probable, the most likely to happen, the probable, doesn't always happen. Sometimes the possible does. Electing a black man president of the United States in 2007, tell me that was probable. It was utterly improbable, but it happened. And in our own lives, we experience possibility. We experience those moments when, well, the odds weren't, but this happened. That, to me, is where hope lies. It's in that experience of the possible, of what can be, the preciousness of the possible, of possibility. So it's not some, some fiction about something. It's, 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 it's lived experience. And how to access the sense of the possible, for me, is where hope is. And then there's uh, solidarity, empathy, love, to counter isolation. And then there's ikmed, ikmed. On our chart, it says ikmed. What's ikmed? You can make a difference. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. It's self-efficacy. It's that you can make a difference. In other words, it's the experience that, yeah, yeah, if I do this, it, could, it actually could matter. It actually could make a difference. A lot of times people don't, people don't vote because they think it's not going to make any difference. And unfortunately, they're right about it too many times. You know, sometimes we think that we motivate people by making things easy and costless. Actually, we motivate people by making them valuable. People will pay costs if they think that it really matters, if they think that, that it will make a difference if they do it or not. I mean, that's kind of the logic of commitment. The logic of commitment is different. So the question then is how, on the one hand, to create challenge and on the other one to create this capacity for hope, for empathy, for self-worth that enables us to access the emotional resources we need to respond to challenges courageously. Now, that's where stories come in. Stories all have three elements. They all have a plot. They all have a character. They all have a moral. Now, what does it take to make a plot a plot? As long as it's just the expected deal, nobody pays attention, nobody cares about that. It's when something unexpected happens 
that then we begin to pay attention. And so then the question is, why does that get our attention? Well, it's interesting, I'm curious, I want to know what's going to happen. Yeah, but why? What's, what's at stake for us? Why? Really, we spend billions of dollars a year on this thing. I mean, books and plays and novels, and they all have the same mechanism. It's the same mechanism. And, and we're, what's at stake for us? How many times does the unexpected to happen to you each day in little ways? And then there's big ways, right? People lose jobs. People lose loved ones. Marriages break up. Threats, dangers, challenges that we have to deal with. We have to deal with them. We have no choice but to deal with them. And we seem infinitely curious to learn how. The fact that we can observe somebody doing something and experience it as if we were doing it. And that's how stories work. And so when, when we identify with the protagonist in the story, we're actually experiencing some of the fear, some of the hope, some of the anger, some of the, some of the redemption that goes on. And so the moral that a story teaches is not just an abstraction like haste makes waste, it's a piece of experience. It teaches the heart, not just the head. It's emotional learning. I mean, that's why faith traditions all teach through stories. They're, they're teaching us how to deal with hopelessness, how to deal with despair, how to find sources of hope, and offering us s sources for that. What about families? Who'd you hear your first stories from? Yeah, I mean, everybody here is a professional storyteller, right, if you have kids. What's going on there? Why is all that storytelling? What's, what's the point? Jerome Bruner reported that 85% of the time parents spend with young children is in storytelling. Why? Instruction. He called it instruction in agency. Let me tell you about Uncle Charlie. Now, Uncle Charlie started out good, but you know, he took a wrong turn. And I don't know, but you know, Aunt Sally over here, boy, she got it right. And you know, let me tell you about Aunt Sally. What family does not have those stories? And those stories are all stories from which we learn because we identify with Uncle Charlie and Aunt Sally and we begin to internalize those lessons and we begin to acquire the emotional resources for being choiceful, agentic human beings. That's what stories teach. That's how stories work. So they're not trivial. They're in fact one of the major ways we actually understand ourselves and the world in which we live. Now, public narrative is a way of harnessing the power of story to the work of leadership. And it's a way of harnessing that power in three ways. First is through a story of self. It's by harnessing the power of story to use stories from our experience. And stories are all structured in the same way. There's a moment of challenge. There's a moment that the protagonist is confronted with a choice. And then there is an outcome. Okay, that's kind of the basic. That's, what make, that's at the heart of a plot are those moments, actual moments. How can, we, how can we share moments in our lives to enable others to understand, to get, to feel why we've been called to what we've been called to? I'm not talking about resumes. I'm not talking about titles. I'm talking about values. I'm talking about what's actually called us. And I use the word calling deliberately. What do we want to do in the world? What difference do we want to make in the world? Sometimes people say, oh, I don't want to talk about myself. You know, I don't, I, I, I'm very modest. I don't want to talk about myself. Well, there's a problem there, you know, and John Kerry, you remember John Kerry? I mean, he's Secretary of State now, but you remember when he ran for president? You remember what he could never do? Tell his story? He had a great story, heroic story. He could never tell the story. So who told the story for him? Swift boat. See, the reality is if you're in public life and you don't claim authorship of your story, others will. And you may not like the way they author it. So I don't think you have a choice. I think you got to step up and author your story and shape it. Oh, no, but that means I've got to be vulnerable. Oh, God, well, we can't have any vulnerability around, right? I mean, we all know that leadership's about being invulnerable, right? Leadership's like, all right, all right. Really? Is that really what it is? What do you learn from perfect people? Do you learn anything from perfect people? Do you even believe them ever? See, one of the reasons I like Moses is he's so flawed. There are so many struggles, and so there is so much to learn. See, our heroism, our courage is connected to our, to our failures, to our faults, to our struggles. And so this whole thing about bringing vulnerability into an account of one's story makes it real, makes it authentic. To empower authenticity with the skill, with the craft, with the, the intentionality that it merits and deserves. Because God knows there's a lot of that going on to serve inauthenticity. That's a story of self. Then a story of us is using narrative, moments of narrative and experience to bring alive values that we share, moments that we remember, Moments that we've shared as a group. But a story of us is not based on categories. We think of us as often as this category or that category. You know, I'm a this, so I can't be a that. It's not a categorical us. It's an experiential us. In other words, it's moments in which we share the experience 
the joy when a child surprises us and learns when we never thought he or she would. Those are magic moments, aren't they? I'll bet everybody in this room practically can recall those kinds of moments. That's a value we share. It's a value we share. You make a story of us out of those kinds of moments. It's the experience that we share these values, not just, uh, oh, let me tell you the values we share, like making a list. It's not that. It's the experience. And then the story of now. And the story of now is different because the story of now is saying, this moment is now a plot moment. Get what, guess what, folks? At this moment, we are facing a challenge. And we have to choose how to respond. So we have to locate the sources of hope that can open a pathway to action so that we will choose action in this moment in which we are being confronted with the need to act. And that's a story of now. And they all relate to each other. It's not a script. It's not like learning a script. It's not like, oh, I got my public narrative, so now I'm done. Well, you're done when you're in your grave is the reality because our stories unfold as long as we live. Our stories of self evolve, who we are with, our stories of us, our stories of now change and come. So this is not about learning a script. It's about learning a process, a way of processing information so as to be able to translate values into sources of courage and hope and possibility and action. And that's, that's what public narrative is.